What's up guys, BC Amplified. This is Amplified Q&A, the last day of August 2017. You know what that means. It's not technically the last day of summer, but unofficially, the end of August means the end of summer, right? Labor Day is around the corner, the pool's all shut down, the kids go off to school, vacations are finished, summertime's over, man, but not yet. We still have some hours in the day, damn it, and we're going to go. We're going to leave summer of 2017 on a high note. I hope you guys don't mind because it's the last day of summer. I invited Palm Tree Polly, right? What embodies summer more than a palm tree, right? Soaking in the sun, the rays, being at the beach, the nice weather. Palm Tree Polly has to be a part of this Amplified Q&A. We got to leave summer 2017 with a bang, baby. And that's what we're going to do because we got something special planned. We got last week... I did the top five performers of all time for the men. You guys wanted me to do a women's version. Well, I'm going to do that this week. Top five greatest performers of all time for the females. And that's going to be in just a few minutes. But first, guys, I want to do some rapid fire questions. Some questions that subscribers ask me over on YouTube and over on Twitter, my followers. So I want to get some of these out of the way now because sometimes my big Q&A questions like top five greatest females of all time. Uh, sometimes questions like that take me a long time, so I don't know how many rapid fires I can get to. So we're going to do things a little differently. I'm going to hit some rapid fires now. First, I want to start with Jared from Twitter. What's going on with Summer Rae? She's been cleared for a return, but she's not on Raw. First, Jared, you're right. She has been cleared for a return. Number two, she at, right at the end, I, that was in May that she, she got cleared for the return, by the way. At the end of May, she reported to the Performance Center to start training again so she can return. That was the end of May. That was the last we heard about Summer Rae. Uh, where has she been? Nobody fucking knows. We hear she's still training down at the Performance Center, but a lot, a, a lot less than she was. So what does that mean? Is she just ready and waiting to be used? I think that's the case. We saw that with Dolph Ziggler recently. Everyone thought he was just being repackaged. I'm the one who broke to you guys. No, this was not about repackaging Dolph. Dolph was being left off for a simpler reason. They literally had nothing for him. Just like Ty Dillinger playing around on the kickoff show or just missing events, it's because they had nothing for him. Sami Zayn just doing backstage segments, they had nothing for him. So what do you think about the women? Raw can barely get Mickey James, Dana Brooke, and Alicia Fox in a segment in a three-hour Raw. SmackDown has to use all their women in one segment usually just to get them all in. So obviously none of them, SmackDown or Raw, has no room for Summer Rae because creative doesn't have anything for her. So to answer the end of your question, especially Jared, she's been cleared for a return but she's not on Raw. There's no guarantee she's even going to come to Raw. She could go to SmackDown. But first and foremost, let's concentrate on even getting her to WWE's main roster again. Because I just don't see where they place her. I agree with a lot of you guys. I think Summer Rae has more to offer. But just like she's playing victim like everyone else is in WWE, they don't know what to do with someone like her. So... I'm okay with them leaving her off for a while until they have something for her, but here's the problem. They've left her off for over three months. Enough is enough. By now, there should be a plan in action. Because as I'm a fan of them leaving her off until they come up with something, the problem here is it's been long enough, over three months. Now we're in that dangerous territory where she's about to become a distant memory instead of someone who could actually uh, you know, gain momentum in earn the company money while earning herself a respectful career from here on out. Um, we're at the point of no return. And I honestly feel that if we do not get Summer Rae in the next month or two, um, she will become a distant memory and people will just not care about her. And on top of that, we're going to get a plethora of new females in that are going to take Summer Rae's spot, whatever that is going to be. We already are hearing returns of the Bella Twins in early 2018. Uh, we already know that Asuka is imminent. We know that Ember, New Ember Moon will be after Asuka. And who knows who they want to put in even before that. Would Nikki Cross show up with a Peyton Royce or a Billy Kay maybe show up out of nowhere? WWE has done that before where they give us surprises. What I'm saying, guys, is it's already overcrowded in that female division. We want to see new blood, young blood. But someone like Summer Rae, her window is closing fast. She's already a veteran. She's already been there for years. I already think Vince McMahon has lost a lot of faith in her. This is her one shot. When she comes back, it's got to be hit the ground running with something ultimate. 
I, I would have loved her. I said in an amplified booking for uh, SummerSlam uh, 2017. I said in that video, I would have loved her with Goldust. Goldust needs that next Marlena character manager in his corner because that's how he thrived when he debuted in WWE. I think that should be his one last run here in WWE with someone like a Marlena character. Summer Rae would play that perfectly. It would get her name back out there. It would give her recognition, put her in the spotlight. And when Goldust is gone, Summer Rae can catapult her career from that character. That's just one thought. You could do a dozen different things with Summer Rae. Get creative. Get her in these events. Stop keeping her on the sidelines, man. She's a talent. She can be better. Give her the time of day. Uh, but that's it, Jared. I, I wish I had more info for you. It's literally just Vince not knowing what the fuck to do with her. Creative having nothing to do with her. Uh, for her. And, and because of that, Summer Rae is just twiddling her thumbs, waiting for that phone call. Ashley on Twitter. Is Ziggler leaving? Right? There's a new report. At end of October, Ziggler's out of WWE. That's coming up in just a couple months. A lot of people are saying Ziggler just came back to WWE to do one feud, one job for Bobby Roode, and then he's gone. And I think that came from, guys, Ric Flair. Last October, it was Dolph Ziggler and The Miz. Remember, I think that pay-per-view was No Mercy, but it was a uh, joint branded pay-per-view, I believe. Or maybe they were already brand splitted. But the point is, it was Dolph Ziggler and The Miz. And, uh, and everyone was reporting because of Ric Flair that Ziggler's contract actually does expire last October and he could be leaving. And so Ric Flair, you know, broke that on his podcast. And so if Ziggler signed a one year deal, that would mean this October. So that would be correct. Here's the problem. I like the deal in facts. June 26, 2015, everybody reported guys, every Dirt sheet, every uh, reputable news source, everybody reported that Ziggler re-signed with a multi-year deal with WWE. Again, guys, that was in June 2015, multi-year deal. We thought it was four, but then Forbes came out with their contract listing, and that had Dolph Ziggler listed at three years. So, okay, original report said multi, three years would be multi. So that means June 2015, 16, 17, 18. That means the summer of 2018, Dolph Ziggler's contract expires. I'm just going by facts. You guys can look it up yourself. Uh, fucking just, I, I don't know what the fuck you would type up, man. Dolph Ziggler's multi-year contract with WWE or Dolph Ziggler re-signs with WWE. You could Google that shit and it'll come up June 2015. And then if you Google up but contract salaries, I don't know what specifically, I forgot what exactly I did, but I did several sites. Um, you'll see Forbes was one of them. They had Dolph Ziggler listed at three years for the 2017 salaries. Again, put your facts together. If he re-signed in June 2015, the 20, 2017 contract salary listing has him at three years. That means 2018 summer. So where the fuck does October come into play? Is Ric Flair really screwing everybody and making everybody think that? I have no fucking idea, guys. But Ric Flair did say October of last year his contract expires. Now, all of a sudden, we're hearing that October of this year his contract expires. I don't know where the fuck October is even coming into play. Because the facts say summer of 2018. Now, could anything have happened? I guess, man. It wouldn't be a contract ending, though, guys. This would Dolph be going to Vince and saying, please let me leave in October. That's what it would be. I'm not saying Dolph isn't leaving in October. It could be, but he is not going to be because of a contract, guys. This is going to be Dolph getting out of his contract, maybe, but absolutely not. I deal in facts, and until facts are proven otherwise, June 2018, Dolph Ziggler's contract expires. Then I fully expect Dolph to leave WWE, absolutely. But uh, I, I'm hearing nothing about factual evidence saying he's leaving in October unless he went to Vince and said, let me out of my contract. That would be the only way. So I hope that helps, Ashley. Yassine on Twitter. What if at Hell in a Cell, it's Natty versus Tamina? Both are capable of going through tables and such. Here's the thing. Natty and Tamina, Hell in a Cell, I would fucking enjoy that if... Tamina and Natty didn't already prove that they're not willing to go the distance, not willing to take the risks and take those chances. They've already proven, Natty and Tamina have proven at Money in the Bank, 
that they're not willing to do ultimate shit like that. The fun shit, the risk-taking, high-flying chances that really captivate us. Natty and Tamina had their chances at Money in the Bank, and then they had a second chance on SmackDown when they had Money in the Bank Part 2 because they couldn't get it right the first time. So Natty and Tamina on paper would be like, ooh, that could be good. But you get them in there, and they've yet to prove to me that they're willing to go the extra mile. So Yassine, you would be correct on paper. However, Natty and Tamina, until they prove to me that they are willing to go out there and do stuff beyond their limits, beyond their means, shit that I know they're capable of, actually, so it wouldn't even be beyond their means or their limits. They are capable of such. Um, they're just not willing to go that extra mile. Until they prove that, I, I gotta say, I don't want to see Natty and Tamina at Hell in a Cell. Um, yeah, I, I just don't want to see it. Not yet. They gotta prove it. Sam, also on Twitter, do you think Sasha is maybe a handful backstage? I guess he's, uh, Sam is probably, um, going to the fact that Sasha is always getting screwed, and we hear that it might be backstage politics, so is she a handful backstage? I absolutely think she's a handful backstage, Sam. Um, that's why we love Sasha, though. Sasha Banks is a no-bullshit personality. She had a rougher upbringing. She had to grow up a lot sooner than maybe she should have. And because of those circumstances and the way she was brought up, she's no bullshit to this day, you know? And she's not gonna pull any punches or pull her words. If she likes you, she's gonna tell you she likes you. If she doesn't like you, you're gonna know she doesn't like you. And so Sasha Banks is not gonna play politics as good as all the other females maybe play politics. On top of that, we know Sasha has a little bit of a click, right? Her boyfriend, or I'm sorry, her husband... Um, is actually the, uh, you know, he does the costumes for the WWE performers. Um, so she's already tight with one person backstage there. On top of that, we know she's always on up, up, down, down. She's tight with the New Day. And so we know there are a lot of jokesters backstage. And Sasha's part of that little clique. And who knows if corporate or writers or maybe even Vince McMahon themselves kind of see that and kind of just roll their eyes, you know, and all, there's the jokesters. Who knows? But she tries to have fun backstage. She doesn't want to play politics. And you know what? In WWE, sometimes that gets you in some fucking screwed up situations. Screwed up situations. As in getting screwed. So, yeah, I think she's a handful backstage. But nothing out of the fucking norm. Or nothing that should be getting her in these type of situations. Nothing that says, I'm going to hold the belt four times for like a total of less than a hundred fucking days. Nothing should be, you know, should get somebody in hot water to that point. Even if she had a fight with somebody backstage, or yelled, or, you know, I don't see Sasha Banks throwing elbows and punches at people. So if it's a fight, it's a fucking verbal match. Suck it up, buttercup. Get back on there and do what's right for business. I'm talking about corporate, any suit and tie, if it's Vince McMahon himself who she yelled at. Put on your big boy pants and do what's right for business. Sasha Banks should be your champion right now for a long time. Sasha Banks should be in all the main events right now because nobody can beat this fucking woman. So, handful backstage, I guess, but what's your definition of handful? You know what I mean? Because I think she's, she's handling herself fucking perfectly. And because of the politics and the way you're supposed to be backstage, maybe that's hindering her. Who the fuck knows? WWE underscore pig over on Twitter. How do people boo Cena after he cuts such a promo is beyond me. So WWE underscore pig on Twitter. He's talking about John Cena's uh, promo he just cut on Roman Reigns, that face-to-face -face shoot this past Monday. And he's basically saying after that, how are people still booing John Cena? Well, WWE underscore pig, I can tell you this. It's not some people's cup of fucking tea, or can I say a cup of coffee? It's not what people like. They went from the Attitude Era. Again, a lot of this isn't even John Cena's fault. But you go from the Attitude Era to fucking PG Cena. And his bright-ass colors and catering to kids, refusing to go heel, refusing to be put in epic fucking storylines that would really appease the grown-ups in attendance... No, it was all about the kids, it was all about the colors, it was always about the fucking Hulk Hogan's basically, right? Say your prayers, prayers, eat your vitamins, uh, drink your milk, whatever the fuck Hulk Hogan used to say, man. Oh, it's been so long. John Cena comes along, and he's basically the new version of Hulk Hogan, right? Uh, never give up, stay loyal, respect, hustle, loyalty, respect, I think is his three things. It was not what a lot of people wanted, it's not what a, a lot of people liked, and it's what a lot of people just want to get rid of. 
So I hope that answers your question. I totally agree with you. I just recently, a year ago, when Cena really started to come back and we started to see that, oh shit, Cena's only going to be part-time for a while now, or from here on out. And I kind of took Cena for granted a little bit because I see what he does bring to the business. He actually does put on good matches. I mean, we can name literally 10 really good John Cena matches. Not just with AJ Styles, not just with Kevin Owens, not just with Sami Zayn. You go down the line, Cena's had some fucking good matches. Even my fucking big time, big fight feel matches like Lesnar and John Cena, Extreme Rules, that was fucking nuts. And then you see what he can do on the promo, on the mic. John Cena brings a lot to the fucking table, but because he was used in such a way a lot of us didn't like, we kind of took him for granted and we kind of wanted him, you know, out of our fucking face, out of the WWE, just leave, just get out, just please go. And, uh, and now we're starting to see, you know, Cena still fucking, Cena gave an awesome line to Reigns and, and it was so mind blowing. It was one of the best parts of that shoot. And he said, uh, I'm still here. I blame you because I'm still here because you can't do your job. And he basically called Reigns right out. <laughs> Reigns, you were supposed to be this position. You were supposed to be this spot. And you can't get over if your life depended on you. So I'm still fucking here having to hold your hand. Um, so yeah, man, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm still to this day. We're days after that promo. And I've already re-watched, re re I can speak, re-watched it about a fucking 50 times. Um, such an epic promo. And I gained even more respect for Roman, uh, I'm sorry, for John Cena, but also guys, Roman Reigns as well. Everyone is say, saying Roman Reigns got buried and this and that. After Cena put him in his place and Reigns started pacing back and forth because he was finally just speaking for himself, he was finally pissed off and he was ready to shoot. Once we saw that, man, we got some of the best Roman Reigns mic work of all time in Reigns' career, five years plus. That was the best we've seen Reigns on the mic after that. Because he started just fucking saying, fuck the dialogue. Let me just speak from my mind and my fucking heart. So, hopefully Cena brought out the fucking best in Reigns. Because he did Monday and hopefully we continue to see that. So he didn't quite bury Reigns yet, guys. He definitely won that face-to-face. -face, but I think we got a lot more to see from Reigns. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if I really answered that question. WWE underscore pig over on Twitter. Uh, you know, how can people boo Cena after that promo? I can just tell you that for a lot of people, it's not their cup of coffee, man. And it was a sudden jolt. You went from the Attitude Era to, to this PG Cena era. And a lot of people uh, just did, it was too much. It wasn't even Cena's fault that a lot of people booed him. It was just the transition was not smooth. And Cena was the poster child for everything we didn't like about that era. So that's why. I'm personally not one of them that boo him anymore. I'm literally going to ride out this Cena wave until he leaves WWE. And I'm going to start appreciating him a little bit more than I have the last 10 to 15 years. Um, last question. Martin. Hi, BC. Who is... Your, uh, this was... I don't know if this was uh, Twitter. This might have been over on YouTube, actually. Uh, Martin. Could be Twitter, though. I did not have that down. Hi, BC. Who is your favorite in The Shield? My favorite in The Shield, it, this kind of goes hand in hand with what I just spoke of, and that's Roman Reigns, actually. I know a lot of people think it would be Dean Ambrose because he's a little bit more hun unhinged like I am. Uh, Seth Rollins, right? He got, he got the, uh, the kind of push that was a little better than Dean Ambrose, so a lot of people thought it would be maybe Seth Rollins that I would like a little bit more. And a lot of people know that I've bashed Roman Reigns a lot over the last year. So a lot of you probably think it would not be Roman Reigns. No, it's Roman Reigns. He was my favorite in the Shield from the beginning. You guys know I like the big fight feel kind of guy in match. I like the heavyweights, those big time, you know, just larger than life. And I think Roman Reigns can be that guy. Why I bashed Roman Reigns for the past year wasn't because of Roman Reigns the man. It was Roman Reigns the character and the people and creative that were backing Roman Reigns. And Vince McMahon for not doing what was right for the business. And for fans to really gravitate toward Roman Reigns, he needed to turn heel. We're starting to see that now over the last two months. Roman Reigns getting more heelish every week. And even people like me are starting to like Roman Reigns even more every week. From day one, Roman Reigns was my favorite in The Shield. I just hated where they were going with him. Now we're starting to see Reigns at his best. Now, if this past Monday is any indication, hopefully his promo is starting to open up. And he starts to shoot a lot more and speak from his heart and his mind. But I don't mind Dean Ambrose. I don't mind Seth Rollins. But easily, Roman Reigns 
was my favorite in the Shield. When they reunite, which they're going to eventually, guys, it'll be Roman Reigns still. Um, you know, I'm harder on the ones that I think, uh, you know, have such potential and are not, it's not being shown. Those are the ones I'm hardest on. So, that was just some rapid fire, guys. Thank you so much for uh, asking your questions on Twitter and uh, over at BC Amplified and on YouTube. Obviously, BC Amplified channel. Uh, what you're watching right now, you should be anyway. Um, now we're going to go into, where do you guys go? Do you want to do it? The top five greatest females of all time in WWE. This is the Amplified list. Oh shit, here we go. Palm Tree Paul, are you ready? The top five greatest females in all of WWE's history. We're going to start at five and work our way to the number one greatest female in WWE's history. Guys, it was hard off the Batman just to pick five. In fact, I kind of didn't. Uh, I, I hate doing ties, right? If I say top five, I mean five. If I say ten of something, I mean ten. There's no exceptions. Um, this is the first time I've done a list that I, I have to do a tie on one of these. I'll get to that in, in a few numbers. Um, but I actually had to pick six uh, females. But I want to start up at number five. And, and, and again, before I do, I just want to say again how hard this was. I had to leave females like Alundra Blaze off the list, guys. Alundra Blaze, there was a time in those mid-90s, she was the women's division. She was that fucking, I mean, it was just, what she ended up doing, she went to WCW and dropped that title into the trash. That is uh, reprehensible. That is, uh, in my mind, I would never forgive somebody for doing that. I don't know how Vince McMahon was able to do that. Um, it really wasn't best for business. You didn't ever need to bring Alundra Blaze back. I'm glad he did because I do like Alundra Blaze. And I'm glad she got a second chance. But uh, that was pretty fucking nuts because Alundra Blaze was such a key part in history for WWE and for Vince McMahon. For her to tarnish and burn a bridge like that, that was fucking heavy. She was, guys, right up until the last second. She was number five, Alundra Blaze. I took her off the last second. I had to put in somebody who's actually on the roster now. And that is Charlotte. Charlotte grabs the fifth spot. Charlotte is one of the top five greatest females in WWE's history. And that's hard to do, guys, when you're talking about the history of WWE and you put somebody who's wrestling right now, who's only been here a few years, uh, and you're kicking out somebody like Alundra Blaze who made a career out of that. That takes balls to do, but I just did it. You look at Charlotte's accomplishments, man. She was a, a former, the first, or one time, I should say, not first, a one-time Divas champion a four-time Raw champion. She's over on SmackDown now. Going to capture that fucking strap. Rookie of the Year for PWI in 2014. The Woman of the Year in 2016. The accomplishments that she has already racked up. And you think about how really fucking dominantly good this, this woman is. It, it scares you to think what is in the future for Charlotte Flair. This is just what she's done in, in the past, in her first couple years. Mind-blowing to think what happens next, in the next year, in the next two years, five years from now. I mean, you're talking about somebody who's got seven to ten more years in her prime. Seven to ten more years in her prime. She could even go past a decade if she wants to. Mind-blowing to think what she's going to do in the future, but what she's already done. How she already captivates us. How she is in her matches, how she athletically just dominates everybody, except for, like, if, if you put Naomi in there, she can athletically go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her, as can an Ember Moon when she gets there. But Charlotte just, I mean, you can see when she's in the ring how much better she is than most everybody else she's wrestling against. Uh, just a pleasure to watch, and there's no way I can leave Charlotte off this list. She's in at number five. Uh, for what she has already done, what she is doing, and what she's going to do. Charlotte's at number five. Number four. We're going way back. Blast in the past. The fabulous Moolah. Now, first, let me just say, when I talk about how hard this was and leaving females off like Alundra Blaze, well, I can also put Mae Young into that, right? But Mae Young, if you really studied her body of work and you only have five spots, you could see why I left Mae Young off of that. But Mae Young definitely deserves accolades like a Mae Young Classic, a whole tournament dedicated to her. She definitely deserves that. But it's fabulous Moolah that grabs the fourth spot. You're talking about a four-time WWF champ. 
Two different times, guys. She was a five-time NWA champ, and two times she had 10-year reigns. Think about that. In a time where we pay, play hot potato, imagine holding a strap for 10-plus years twice. That's what May, I'm sorry, Fabulous Moolah did on two different occasions. But that was the NWA championship. This is a WWE list only, guys. This isn't Japan because then we can bring even more crazy, insanely awesome females onto the list. But this is only WWE. But I did feel that I had to give you guys that little tidbit of fucking information. Two 10-year reigns with that NWA strap. It was a badass is that I believe, what was it, 1983? The Fabulous Moolah actually sold that NWA championship to Vince McMahon in the WWE. How fucking badass. At 76 years old, Fabulous Moolah won the strap, the WWE Women's Championship. This was, I believe, in 1999 at 76 years old. She won that championship back. That's how badass. That's the legacy that Fabulous Moolah is going to leave behind. And that's why she's in at number four. Number three, if you want to talk badass, we have to go with China. China makes my list at number three. She's a two-time women's champion, but how about a two-time intercontinental champion? I can't make that shit up. Go do your research, guys. She won the IC strap twice. She was the very first woman to ever enter the Royal Rumble. This is a woman who not only fought women, but fought dudes and won. Won straps. If that's not mind-blowingly captivating, then I don't know what to tell you and you have to start watching something else because this business isn't for you. Because that's mind-blowingly captivating. China easily fits in at number three and it's amazing that there's women that actually beat her in this list. But there is. And that's where we come up with a tiebreaker. I had to put two women in at number two. Lita has to be there with Trish. They go hand in hand. So at number two is Trish Stratus and Lita. Trish Stratus was at number two by herself until I thought, there's no way you can leave out Lita on this list. And that's why for the first time, one of my lists has to have a tiebreaker, and I do. Trish Stratus, you're talking about a seven-time women's champion. She was the PWI Women of the Year at one point. A hardcore champion. Remember the hardcore championship, guys? You talk about China holding the IC strap twice. How about Trish not only holding seven times the WWE Women's Championship, but how about Trish Stratus holding the Hardcore Championship? Talk about blasting the fucking dudes. Trish Stratus was hardcore at one point in her career. Uh, PWI Woman of the Year, as I, as I proclaimed. But these years, guys, multiple years, not just once. PWI Woman of the Year in 2002, 2003. 2005, 2006, Trish Stratus owned the 2000s. Carried that women's division, if, if you think about it, with Lita. Trish Stratus is obviously there at number two, and she's there with her counterpart. She's there with, as I mentioned, Lita, who in her own right was a four-time women's champion. And Lita was the only woman in a TLC match, guys. Think about that. Tables, ladders, and chairs. They put in a woman in there, and it wasn't just any female. It was Lita. Think about what an accomplishment. Only female to be in a TLC match. And guys, this was years and years ago. They just recently, 2017, just a few months ago, finally gave the women a Money in the Bank match. So you imagine how times have changed and, and how times were back then when Lita was competing in that match against all these fucking dudes. That's fucking insane, man. Trish Stratus and Lita both take the number two spot. Number one, and this is going to be controversial. This will ring up a lot. This may even get some people angry. How can you do that? And of all time, and you pick a current superstar, and you're being biased because you love her. You ready? Sasha Banks, number one on the Amplify list. Top five greatest females of all fucking time. That's right, I said it. I didn't stutter once. Your hearing is not going. Your volume didn't fuck up. Sasha Banks is number one. BC, how the fuck are you put... China, Fabulous Moolah, you left off Alundra, Mae Young, all these WWE fucking legends. Sasha Banks has only been here a few years. How, what, what? 
let me explain. Not even that I need to, because I think you guys know exactly why. But just as Charlotte has to be up there in this list, and she's only been there the same amount of time as Sasha, Sasha Banks for many reasons. But I'll just start off some of her accomplishments just in a few fucking years, guys. How about a four-time Raw Champion? Four-time Women's Champion, right? And... Forget how many days she's been champion because we all know that was the booking and that's her getting the fucking ultimate screw job. For people like me, that won't, to hopefully people like me won't put them, these females, on lists like this. Or people that WWE wants to put the screw job to, hopefully people like me won't put them on their list and talk great about them. Because see, they're being booked poorly. No, no, no. You ain't gonna pull the wool over my fucking eyes. I've been watching this shit too long. I'm too smart. I know exactly what's going on. I know who's great and who sucks. Who's just good and who's just bad. Sasha Banks is beyond great. I said it a million times. I'll say it a million plus one. She is the Daniel Bryan of the female division. Somebody that when they come to the ring, it just fucking captivates you. Forget the four-time champ. How about Rolling Stones? Match of the year and title feud of the year in 2015. How about PWI's Women of the Year and match and feud of the year? All three of those in 2015. How about the Teen Choice Award for Best Female Athlete in 2017? Multiple Raw main events, the first ever Iron Man match for the women, the first ever Hell in a Cell match for the women, over there with Char. That is just some of the shit she's already done in the first couple of years. The dominance that she will do in the next year, two years, and three years. And if she doesn't leave WWE, just like Charlotte, she has another seven to ten years of her prime, of her prime. And then she could go more than a decade if she wants. Imagine what she's going to put together. The portfolio. Just look at how great she fucking is. I say the word a lot and I use it especially for females and other fucking competitors when it, when it, when it comes time to... Now I'm coming over my own fucking stuttering over my own fucking words. That like I have to put over Sasha Banks. I have to fucking stutter over. I have to put her over. No, she puts herself over. You think about how often, how often I use the words captivating. That's Sasha Banks in a nutshell. If you look up captivating in the dictionary, it should say Sasha fucking Banks. Or reference Sasha Banks. Absolutely fucking cat. I don't even need statistics anymore. Or accomplishments. Or awards. Or titles. You watch a Sasha Banks match. And wham! I promise you are captivating. You watch a Sasha Banks match, and I, 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 I ask you guys, please do not take it for granted. Because you right now, even if they get booked poorly, booked like shit, your favorites, maybe Becky Lynch, maybe Dana Brooke, maybe Emelina, or Emma, whatever your fucking favorite is, if they get booked poorly, I understand that. But we are in right now the greatest era that we've ever seen. For the women. And I'm even talking Fabulous Moolah's days with Mae Young. Where they respected the belt on somebody for years. But when you look at the level of competition. I promise you Wendy Richter is not going to light a candle to any of the females in the WWE today. That's what I mean. You have the best of the best. And at the top of the best of the best is the best. And that's Charlotte. And in my opinion even right above her is Sasha. She is mind-blowingly captivating every time she's in the ring you stop and you watch just fucking greatness for the women that's fucking special man and there is no way Sasha Banks is not the greatest female in the WWE of all time already already and she's in the middle of gathering her career together and putting a career together for herself that in 20 and 30 years she can look back on and say, yeah, I did that. Yeah, I was the best. Right now, she's already the fucking best. And she's only been doing this a few years. The future is promising. Whether they book her, her properly or not, Sasha Banks is going to continue to put on the best fucking matches possible. Bailey, Charlotte, Becky Lynch... I could keep going on and on. What do they all have in common? Their greatest match was with Sasha Banks. Not a fucking coincidence. That's just the best. That's the top five greatest females. 
of all time, guys, on the Amplified list. Again, you had Charlotte at number five. You had Fabulous Moolah at number four. You had China at number three. You had a tie for number two. Trish Stratus and Lita both make the spot. And at number one, you had Sasha Banks. If you guys are all hot-tempered, pissed off, you want to fucking tell me why one of my people shouldn't be on the list and this and that, hold it, guys. It ain't gonna matter. My list has already been made. It has already been sent out to the world. I stand by it. If you guys have a different list, maybe it's the same five. You want them kind of switched around. Maybe you have a totally different five. Maybe one or two. You just want to take off mine and replace it with one or two that you think. That's cool. Don't get angry. Don't get pissed. Or then again, get angry. Get pissed. It's Amplified Channel, baby. That's what we do. But what I would do is tell me your list. Tell me your five. Maybe you put together a kick-ass five. But do me a favor. Make it realistic. Telling me that Emelina is on there or Summer Rae, who again I think has potential, but she has not reached that yet. Telling me that fucking Summer Rae should be on there. Telling me that Wendy Richter should be up on there. Or, or telling me that Alicia Fox is one of the top five greatest female. You know, it, that's not going to be realistic, obviously, guys. Put together, and this is hard to do. I said it last week for the men. This is hard to do to really stop and think about all the females that have graced that WWE squared circle. And you can only put together five. The past, the way, way past, and maybe even some present. If you think a female right now wrestling today deserves it. I thought two of them deserved to be in that five list. Because we have the greatest competitors at a time right now. Better than it was 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 1 year ago. The best is here. What is WWE going to do with them? We'll wait and see. In 5 years, would I maybe have a different top 5 list? Maybe. We'll see what the future holds. But for right now, Sasha Banks holds the throne. Sasha Banks is just the greatest of all fucking time. I'm BC. This is Amplified. We're going to get some coffee. We're going to kick the rest of summer's ass. The last day of summer. And I'm going to see you guys in September. Tomorrow. For now, I'm BC. We'll check you later.